So guys, just going to run through tonight's agenda. Uh, we will be doing a brief introduction, trying to keep things short, because I know we only have about an hour and a half here. Uh, we're going to kind of pull the room just to understand exactly who we're talking to and what you're all hoping to get out of a session like this. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of sales methodology. And then we're going to get really nitty gritty into some prospecting tips and techniques. So really the purpose of this session is to understand how to make cold calls, leave voicemails, do some cold emailing, and really drive that first touch point. Um, prospecting is all, is all about just really booking that second meeting. We're not going to be talking about the full sales cycle here, really just the first step in the sales process, which is having that initial conversation. Um, based on that there, you know, is that a fair agenda? Was there anything up there that you were hoping to see that's not on there? Go back. No, nope. thank her. Okay, cool. So I'm going to start off with a quick video here. Out of curiosity, who's seen sales movies like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or Boiler Room? Yeah, a couple people, a couple nods. I hate those movies. So they really, yeah, they misrepresent sales as a profession. You've got these guys in these slick suits, they're smooth talkers, and it makes sales really seem like it's natural and it's this innate ability and that you're kind of born with it. When in reality, sales is more like what you see in Tommy Boy or in Pursuit of Happiness, where it's about being self-aware, it's about repetition, it's about measurement and analytics, and it's about refining it. Uh, it's about learning through your mistakes. So can I show a quick clip here from one of my favorite sales movies, Tommy Boy? If you could just start from one minute, that'd be great. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this movie, but they're in a diner. They just came off a pretty bad sales call. Not here, or here so much, but right here. Nope. Shape, shape. And he's going to describe sales perfectly. Yeah, it's closed. Okay. I'll just have a sugar packet or two. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Helen. That's nice. You look like a Helen. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. Let's say I go into some guy's office. Let's say he's even remotely interested in buying something. Well, then I get all excited. I'm like, Jojo, the Indian circus boy with a pretty new pet. Well, the pet is my possible sale. Oh, my pretty little pet. I love you. So I stroke it, and I pet it, and I massage it. Yeah, I love it. I love my little naughty pet. You're naughty. And then I take my naughty pet, and I go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I killed it. I killed my sale. <laughs> That's what I call it. That's when people like us have got to forge ahead. Yeah, you get it. So just to reiterate, sales, yeah, being self-aware, learning from mistakes, and really just not making the exact same mistake twice. We're all gonna blow sales, we're all gonna have rough pitches, we're all gonna have tough intro calls and tough cold calls. For anyone who's ever cold called, it's not easy. Um, the important thing is that you develop a cadence and that you refine. I'm gonna flip it over to Al for a quick introduction here. Awesome, so first thanks everybody for coming. By way of quick introduction, my name is Ali Shankara. I like to start off by giving a brief history of my sales career so that you really understand who's standing in front of you, who's chatting with you, and then if you do have questions or you guys have seen similar roles, we can absolutely feel free to talk about it. So I started my career at Canon selling photocopiers. If you guys have ever had a business card ripped up in front of you by a customer in front of your face, or had somebody smile at you and then realize you're from a photocopier place and then put their head down and keep typing, that's when you really know what sales is. Uh, I moved on to Salesforce where I was a sales engineer and started my own business on the side, Goose Chase, which is a mobile application for scavenger hunts where I'm the VP of marketing and sales now for about half a million dollars in revenue over the course of five years. Most recently, I have started working at Flashlock over the past year where I was an account executive focused on enterprise sales, so working with companies like Pfizer, Budweiser, Estee Lauder, and recently have moved into a manager role where my day-to-day my -day is focusing on sales development, uh, managing eight individual sales development reps, so really focusing on the art of prospecting, cold calling, getting in front of customers, and really identifying what that next step is. Thank you, and then myself, my name is Chris Gray. So you'll notice some similarities in our uh, career history here. So Al kept telling me all these great things about Canon, how awesome of a job it was, and then I started and he quit about a week later, so I was kind of on my own here. Uh, I moved from Canon, uh, I went over to, uh, actually I did a master's at Ryerson here, so is anyone familiar with the MDM, the Master's in Digital Media Program? 
Yeah, a couple of people. Yeah, it's run out of the, uh, the digital media zone there. So I was in the first cohort there. Um, from that program, which was an awesome program, by the way, uh, I launched my own startup called Vuvo, which is a 3D printing marketplace. Um, we actually showcased uh, some of our products in this room about two years ago when uh, really all this area was coming together. Uh, we were in the DMZ for about a year, uh, kind of drove the business into the ground uh, and left. But while I was doing that, I was at Ryerson Futures, which is the campus led venture capital firm, uh, doing analysis of startups and really listening to pitches and bringing people in for uh, convertible to venture investments. From there, I moved on to Salesforce, so that's what I'm currently doing now. I work uh, in the SMB market, which is small to medium-sized businesses. I work in Boston, so I sell to um, Harvard and MIT startups, which is pretty interesting. Uh, and on the side, I've made a, a Chrome extension which corrects improper or invaluable sales language as you're typing up prospect emails in your Gmail, and it makes suggestions on words and terminology that's going to resonate a bit better with the prospects. Now, we're gonna quickly just pull the room and understand really what everyone's hoping to get out of this session. Uh, I know we don't have a ton of time, so maybe we'll just keep it to the tables here in the front. Uh, if you guys could just give a brief, a brief introduction of who you are, really just what your role is. Are you a founder? Are you looking to get into sales? And one or two things you're hoping to get out of a session like today. I'm just gonna start with you here. Sure, um, so I, I work full time at a tech company called Adobe. Cool. On the side, my awesome. family owns a, a print shop. We do industrial printing for like Bacardi, Cool, I'm trying to grow it, yeah. Got it? Hey. Um, I actually um, quit my job. Okay. I was in the fitness industry and then I was at Cardi B uh, teaching at university. And I actually just fired myself, so I'm starting uh, my new company and I'm working with this really well in the So I'll be uh, exiting in August. Okay, got it. Awesome. Cool. Experience as are you doing? Are you a founder? Or are you doing a sales role for a startup? Uh, or? I've been doing like doing sales role for cool. Like Got it. Awesome. Good. So I am Jackie Francis, and my company is Startup. And uh, my next step is to get a corporate startup. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn how to sell. Yeah, awesome. so just trying to find a way to book these, uh, I guess, beta cool. launches. Yeah. Awesome. <coughs> yes, um, my startups don't really um, involve this, but I came because I figured I can always learn something. For sure. Mm -hmm. So I uh, spent six months working at a health center here in Ibiza, mm -hmm. and I'm just here to give my prospect an interview. So who are you calling on then? Is it okay. like a wedding party? or Pardon? Who are you calling on? Is it the two people getting married, or is it like a, a yeah. wedding studio? I don't really know. We're doing every, we want the best uh, entertainment. Okay. So we'll fill out a form on the website, Got and it. then I call them back. Oh, okay, so are kind of warm leads then. Yeah. Okay. So, well, Yeah, yeah. So I'm here to learn as much as I can. Great, yeah, well, we'll cover that, yeah. Hey, yeah, my, my name is Mike. Uh, my company's called iDetail. We're a mobile car cleaning and detailing service. So what we do is go to client's house and detail their car. Uh, my service areas involve building a direct sales team, but right now we're having challenges doing uh, BD, like business That's development. Um, I've been cold calling a lot. I don't know who to call or, mm -hmm. I don't know. So you're calling individuals? Uh, yeah, kind of calling, yeah, I guess I'm calling individuals, but they're mainly at the executive level. I'm not sure if I'm reaching the right people. Sure. Uh, but I just have no, it, the results haven't shown. That's why it's like, <coughs> the problem is like wide open. I don't know where the problem is. So we're calling kind of high level, we're talking maybe C-level execs? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, okay, cool. Does, what's the follow-up of that? Like, <coughs> say I'll be in touch with people, what's, what's that follow-up? 
Sure. Yeah, yeah. In my opinion, you know, a cold call, the intention is never to sell on that first call. You're just trying to book a meeting. You're trying to get 20 minutes of their time, depending on how long you think you need to, to pitch your, your service. If you're going in person, I'm sure a lot of the techniques we're going to cover today could be replicated in person. We are focusing predominantly on email and phone, but you know, you can take what you can. And we can talk, we can absolutely chat about that after. I know there's a Q&A, so that's something that we've done personally, and I still do, so, and he still does, so happy to absolutely answer those questions. Yeah, thanks. Just quickly, in the interest of time, from what everybody said at the front of the room, does everybody feel like they fit into one of those categories, trying to learn as much as they can, uh, founders who are looking to drive sales, understand how to cold call better, um, and potentially looking for the next big thing? Anybody that we didn't cover off? No? Perfect. So just to keep it going and not to make everyone s sit, I think those, that's a great representation of the room. Oh, good. The first thing I always like to start with when we talk about sales is that understanding that sales is a science. A lot of the people that I talk to ever since getting into sales are like, oh, sales. It's like you just have to be naturally talented at it. You just kind of have to have it to go get it. But the one thing that I learned very quickly is that sales can be formulaic. You can absolutely apply a certain set of numbers and data to sales to understand the areas that you can improve. This is just an, an example of what that might look like. The statistics at the bottom are what I want to touch on first. So 88% is the number of responses that are achieved after or between the fourth and eighth, eighth attempt of reaching out to a cold prospect. Uh, cold prospect, 80% of them reply after the fifth touch. A touch can be an email, a call, a visit to an office, but after the fifth touch. And what's staggering to me when you look at this is that 80% of all sales reps actually give up after the second touch. So I reach out to you once, I may call you a second time and you don't respond to me, I give up, when really that prospect is just waiting for me to understand or for me to show them that I actually do care about their business, I am persistent, I think I really do have a solution that can help, and they'll respond to your, to your email. These statistics will change up and down depending on the role that you're looking to go after in a company, whether it's execution level, director level, CEO level. But it's important to start applying these in your different sales prospecting, especially depending on the customers you're going after, whether it's B2C or B2B. Every single industry, every single organization will have its own formula to follow. This is at the top is just something that one of my reps, this is their formula. Uh, 400 call equals 80 conversations, 20 meetings, equals four proposals, equals one sale. Now that sale could be $150,000, it could be $250,000. Really, it's just a formula to understand where are the areas we can improve. So if we're making 400 calls and getting 80 connects and 20 meetings, maybe we wanna start improving the proposal time or maybe we wanna start improving the conversation time from the connects that we're having. So those different metrics can lead you to different areas of improvement. And if you're sitting or if you're lucky enough to be sitting on a bunch of leads, you know, 300 people have filled out this uh, inbound lead on your, on your website, my recommendation is carve out some time on your calendar, be very dedicated to that time, don't answer emails during that time, and just hammer out these calls one by one. You'll find that every call is going to be better than the previous one because you're learning, you're getting in a bit of a cadence, uh, and you're really just building up a routine. And that would be my recommendation rather than, you know, just cherry picking which ones you think you should call. Just blast them out in a couple of days. Absolutely. And, and to that point, of continuing on sales as a science, you really want to focus on the methodology of applying what you're doing to your sales calls. So as Chris was saying, you can absolutely pick up a role, pick up all these inbound leads, or look at a list and call down all these roles. But unless you understand why you're calling, the reasons you're having these conversations, what the next step is, how prospects are going to be interested, you're not going to really feel like you're accomplished. There's a mantra that I have on my team, and it's celebrate the small wins. So if you make a call and somebody picks up, celebrate that win. If you make a call, somebody picks up and you get a conversation, celebrate that win. Book a meeting, celebrate that win. And those incremental <laughs> wins actually provide motivation and help you get to the next step. These methodologies really talk about how you're going to go from A to B and what the steps between A and B are to accomplish your eventual sales cycle. So I certainly suggest uh, looking through these, reading through these, and really finding the sales methodology that really works for you. Personally. I love Challenger Sale, I love Sandler, and I've sort of smashed them together to come up with my own way of going to market. I also really like framing, so if you guys are interested in resources, we do have a slide at the end that we'll share with you where you can go to download a lot of these resources. If you need more, we're absolutely happy to share those with you as well. Yeah, and just touching on, on Challenger there, being that you know some of you are launching disruptive and innovative startups, 
and there's going to be no brand awareness because they're young companies, uh, focusing on challenges and really understanding how they're currently doing business and then challenging the way that they could potentially be doing business uh, is really strong. So I would highly recommend Challenger for anyone who's launching a startup. Since you guys are all founders, I would 100% recommend downloading the ebook Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. Oren Claff is a famous investor pitcher, I guess you would call him. Pitch Anything, P-I-T-C-H, Anything by Oren Claff. Uh, yes. It's at the uh, back K of the deck. K-L-A-F-F, -F. yeah. Oren Claff. So his whole story is about him pitching ideas to investors and growing businesses into multi-million dollar companies. It talks about how he went from a, a multi-millionaire to having zero dollars in his bank account and raising that back up again, which is really relevant for a lot of the folks here in this room as founders, as serial entrepreneurs who are really looking to grow their careers. So next we will move into prospecting. So guys, the, the death of cold calling. So back when I was at Canon, we used to get these crazy long sheets of leads or of current customers, and we'd expect to just drill down them and phone these people. Um, Al, I think you have a hilarious story yeah. about it. Has, has anybody, I mean, for the people in the room, has anybody had a list, a paper list that they've just had to go down and call people on that list to try and book sales before? Working in a call center. Working at sure, a call yeah. center, you know, work canvassing, that's another one. Yeah, absolutely, selling ad space. I remember I was, I was 21 years old and I was working at Canon and I got a list that looked exactly like this. And my manager was like, all right, 50 calls, one hour, bang out as many calls as you possibly can, come back, report to me at the end of that. I remember my first call, I called that, the business owner and I was like, guys, is, is the owner of this business available? Long pause at the end, I was like, hello? First I was like, that person died three years ago. I was like, so I was like, oh, okay, sorry about that, hang up the phone, next call. Unbelievably, the next call that I had, that person had also died not long ago. And so I have this list of people and I'm looking at two calls in a row going like, everybody on this list is dead. I don't, I don't know who to call at this point. But that's completely changed in today's day and age. Even though we say it's a cold call, really cold calling is, is dead to me because there should be no such thing as a cold call anymore. And we'll explain that in just a second as well. So before we do that, we're going to go through what we both perceive to be a very poor voicemail. If you ever ran a business or ran a startup or ever gotten a voicemail from a salesperson, you know which ones are good and you know which ones are bad. Uh, we're going to teach you what techniques we have found to be successful. But first, let's all break down together uh, this voicemail. So it's just something I found on the internet. Uh, you're going to notice a beep every time uh, she uses the uh, recipient's name. Just kind of ignore that. Uh, obviously, it's, that's the glaring thing that's wrong with it. But we're going to pick it apart and see what you guys think is potentially wrong with it as well. Uh, this is Lisa Rice with Object Associates. Angela, we are one of IBM's premier marketing agencies. Uh, first, Angela, I'd like to make sure that you are the correct person that I would need to speak with regarding uh, sales lead generation for your company. Um, Angela, I have some pertinent information I'd like to go over regarding our lead generation services, which is Prospect Builder. Angela, if you could give me a really quick call back and let me know if you would be the person to speak with or if it would be I sure would appreciate it. And again, Angela, my name is Lisa Wright. So a ton of Angela's. Let's just play it again and just listen closely for everything but the Angela's. That beeping's a little distracting. Hi, Angela. Uh, this is Lisa Wright with Object Associates. Angela, we are one of IBM's premier marketing agencies. Um, first, Angela, I'd like to make sure that you are the correct person that I would need to speak with regarding uh, sales lead generation for your company. Um, so I have some pertinent information I'd like to go over regarding our lead generation services, which is Prospect Builder. So if you could give me a really quick call back and let me know if you would be the person to speak with or if it would be someone else, I sure would appreciate it. And again, Angela, my name is Lisa Rice. I look forward to hearing back from you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. So what do you guys think is wrong with that? Besides the name repetition, you know, let's, let's throw out some ideas here. I've got Anne in the back there. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. With all the tools we have, and we'll cover some of them, you should be able to identify who your prospect is. And really, if you're the recipient of that voicemail, you're probably not going to pick up the phone, call this person and say, you know what, you should be speaking to my partner so-and-so, here's their phone number. People are busy, they're not going to do that. Yes. I, I might be me, but I don't like 
get when someone calls us a business call, they don't know me, and mm -hmm. they call me by my first name. Mm -hmm. I hate that. They're yeah. not my friend. It's mm -hmm. a business call. Okay. I'm Mr. Whoever. Interesting. Yeah, I've never heard that answer before. But yeah, you got to respect it, yeah. Cool. Anybody else, sir? Cool. So this is what I think is wrong with it. First of all, it's the same boring introduction as every other voicemail anyone ever leaves. It's Chris calling from Salesforce. Uh, I've always been taught, and I found to be very successful, to leave your name at the end. Uh, it's just completely different than every other cold call they've ever gotten. Um, and it's a little bit more impactful, I find, anyways. The voicemail goes in to say, hey, I'm calling from so-and-so company. We do this. It's already starting talking about me, me, me. When all of your cold calls, all of your voicemails, they should be about the prospect. You be saying, hey, cu customers who I talk to in this space typically see challenges with XYZ. Does any of that resonate with you? You don't jump in and just talk about yourself. I don't know if you've ever been on a first date and the person just talks about themselves the entire time. You probably didn't enjoy that. Besides and or the name repetition, um, there's no clear and identifiable reason for the call. They haven't done the research. They don't understand if this is going to be a product market fit. And they haven't really identified, you know, this is the reason for my call. That's what I typically like to start my voice, voicemails with. The reason for my call is, and that way it triggers the customer's brain to know this is the important reason that they're calling. The last thing that I would say to that is it's way too long. Yeah. By the first time she said her name, she would have already hung up. She doesn't recognize the voice. She doesn't know that person. And then to go ahead and listen to a voicemail that's 65 seconds long is time out of that person's day where they really don't understand the reason for the call. So keeping it short and concise, and we'll go over the formula for what a good voicemail looks like to drive either callbacks or awareness that you're actually going to be emailing that person so that you can then connect with them the next time you call. And one of the things, she used the word pertinent. Try and dumb down all of your sales uh, outreach. You know, just make it seem very simple, very human. Um, don't use words like pertinent. It's just, it complicates things uselessly. So how do we really improve our calls? Well, we improve them with research, and that's why we had the other slide, you know, the death of cold calling, because all calling should be warm calling now. You should have done a little bit of research, so you know a little bit about your prospect, you can have a compelling introduction, and you can put together something that is I impactful. Doing your research also shows that you're confident your solution is going to resonate with the prospect, so they know you're not going to be wasting their time. Now, there's a couple of different tools you can use here, but some really obvious ones. If you're going to be doing B2B selling, go on LinkedIn, learn a little bit about the person. If you can find any mutual connections, if you can find maybe you went to the same university, you got to find something that is going to resonate with them, something that shows you're human and you're not just trying to get their money from you know, their pocket to your pocket. You also want to look for triggers or changes in their business that might make your solution a good fit. So if you look at tools like Owler or Feedly, these aggregate news articles about your customers and about their businesses. So let's say you have a SaaS-based product you're trying to sell into Coca-Cola, and you like to sell to VPs of marketing. Well, if you use Owler to follow Coca-Cola, you're going to get a ping every time they hire a new VP of marketing. It's a big change in the business. And then you can reach out to the VP of marketing saying, hey, congrats on the new role. Uh, coming into a company like Coca-Cola, you may face challenges with whatever. And then you can go into your solution. But it shows you've done your research and your due diligence and you're aware of what's going on in their business. Same with Google Alerts. Uh, lead Gibbon was actually, someone reached out to me uh, who may be in this class. Are the Lead Gibbon guys in here? No, it doesn't seem like it. I think they're Ryerson startup founders uh, who've created a tool where you can pull out uh, LinkedIn information directly in your inbox, so it just makes pros prospecting a little bit quicker. And then tools like Twitter and Instagram. We're going to talk to you guys about social selling at the end and how you can use social media to sell. Uh, it's a little bit more effective than cold calling and cold uh, voicemails and cold emailing. Uh, we're going to touch on why we think it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. So keeping this in mind, one of the things that I always talk about with my team is know your role. Know who you're reaching out to in the organization and what's important to them for them to be able to or want to pick up the phone and actually have a conversation with you. If you call the CEO or the CMO of a company and you're like, hey, I'd love to talk to you about all the content on your social media websites, LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook, I can almost guarantee you that the CEO and the CMO of that company are like, mm, I, don't, I don't know why you're calling me about that. You're better to talk to the social media manager or maybe the director of digital. So for somebody like iDetail, is it, yeah. for example? Let's say you use Owler or Feedly and you see that the CEO of Ford is like, hey, we want to be in our customers' homes. That's our vision. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to call the CEO of Ford and say, hey, we can get six cars serviced every day for each of your new customers if you sell it as part of a package. 
Now, he doesn't really care about the execution level of that. What well, the CMO or the CEO of Ford cares about at that level is, hey, I saw your article about the vision of being in customers' homes, of Ford employees being in customers' driveways and providing a personal touch. That's important. So these are the three sort of words that I use to think about the role-specific messaging when you're actually going after that specific individual in a company. At the very bottom level is the executioner, the person who's in charge of, in the social media example, posting the content online to social media, to Facebook, creating the content for their CRM platform. The next level up, you're talking about a director level. What's important to them is the return on investment, the analytics. How is this directly affecting my bottom line? Are we seeing revenue generation from customers? Are we seeing engagement? Are we seeing click-throughs? Can I tangibly say that this has had an effect on the business from a monetary standpoint? And at the top level, the vision. So how does this really fit to what our board wants, what our C-suite wants? Is this the direction of the company? Can I bring this back and say, yes, we're moving in the direction that our, our shareholders are actually looking for? So if you can break that down, it's really easy for you then to prospect to different companies giving the same, uh, excuse me, same message based on that role. <coughs> so if you're going to target Ford, Audi, um, Lincoln, Ferrari, at the C-level, you can always de deliver that vision message. At the execution level, you can say, hey, I can make your people more productive by allowing them to detail more cars in a shorter period of time and actually have them be happier and lead more work-life balance. So this is something that I really focus on and I would really encourage you to think about this in regards to your business and your sales cycle because it will really help to drive meetings and conversations. So let's talk about the formula for a successful call. So as I said, everything can be scientifically broken down, formulaic, whether it's the amount of calls you're making or what a successful voicemail looks like. So these are the five steps or the four steps to leaving a strong voicemail or opening up a call to get a prospect's attention immediately. The first thing you want to do is have a compelling reason for calling, an introduction, frame the call. Hey, Mr. CEO, the reason for my call is because we're helping other companies like yours reduce their non-working spend by 40%. Okay, you have my attention. How can I be more efficient? The clear reason for the call is sort of jumped in from the compelling introduction, and then a clear call to action. I'd love to spend five minutes with you to share with you how we're helping those companies do this. Do you have five minutes to quickly go over and hear that customer story and see if we're a good fit for you? The last point, 532, is something that one of my mentors taught me, which I strongly believe in. If you ask somebody for 15 minutes and you can accomplish what you're looking for in five, that person is going to leave that call happy with you because they know that you respect their time and were able to get your point across efficiently and provide value in a short period of time. So if you can say 15 is, 15 is 10 is 5 or 5 is 3 is 2, really what we're trying to say is if you ask for 15 minutes, you really have 10 minutes and you should try and accomplish what you're looking to do in 5 minutes because you've cold called this person out of the blue. Typically with anybody that you're cold calling, cold emailing, cold visiting, the time you ask for that is granted, if you can shorten that time period, they're going to respect that you respect them and you're likely to form uh, a better relationship and build more rapport. This exact formula is a great way to leave a voicemail as well. So, hi Mr. CEO, the reason for my call is to discuss with you how we're helping Samsung and Nokia reduce their non-working spend by 40%. Would love to chat with you for five minutes about how we can help your company do the same. I'm going to give you a call back tomorrow at 1 p.m. exactly on this number. It's Ali Sean from Flash Talk, your number, and you hang up. Now the person has to listen to your call before they actually know who's calling. There's a reason for your call, and they're compelled to listen all the way through. Any questions or thoughts on this before we move on? Yep. Yeah, so it can be a different formula too. So you don't always have to reference customers. What's the compelling event for your call? So what are you going to help companies do? Are you going to save them money? Are you going to allow them to gain more customers? What's your value proposition? Tell them how you're going to help them before, they t or before you talk about yourself, essentially. Sure, you could say, the reason for my call is we've created this disruptive technology that's going to help companies save 50%. We'd love to pilot this with you to see if it's a success. Cool. Yep. So that opportunity for the five-minute phone call really, I'm going to be at FaceTime with them, like to book them for a longer 
in yeah. phase interaction. Absolutely. So I always say that the first cold call is never to sell. It's, and Chris said it earlier. It's always to book the next meeting. What that next meeting is really depends on your industry and, and what you're selling. So for example, if you cold called a bakery or you cold called a vendor that you'd like to work with, for example, if you're like, hey, Wonder Bread, we, wanna, we have a great idea for you based on this um, new disruptive grain that we're selling. Really for you, it's like, I don't want to sell you on the first call. You want to say, what we'd love to do, if this is interesting to you, is book 15 minutes to share some stories or share an ROI. Or we'd like to book 30 minutes to come in and present to your larger team. But the first five minutes earns you the opportunity to get the next step. Good question. Yeah, that's, that's great psychology. It's a, psych, it's a very like, deep psychology play to be like, oh, somebody called my cell phone. I should call them back. But I mean, I don't call anybody back. That doesn't leave me voicemails because it's often telemarketers. Yeah, if so I find that you might be misleading them a little bit too. And there's a lot of techniques that will mislead a prospect into reaching out back to you. And it never ends well. I've gotten emails where they've put four of those re, re, re as if I've missed a bunch of emails from them. And the guy will say, yeah, you missed my last four emails, just wondering if you, know, you have a chance to chat. And I looked at it, I was like, I definitely didn't get any emails. And I saw the technique online as a great way to get people to respond to you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you're not misleading them. But if they're calling you back and you know, if you're giving your value prop in that voicemail and they don't call you back, it's probably not a good fit. And they're probably not a good use of your time. Yeah. The good point is qualifying out is just as important as qualifying in. Right? If, if somebody picks up the phone and says, you know, we're really not a good fit for you guys, here's why, at least you know you don't have to call that person ever again. <coughs> so qualifying out is always as important as qualifying in. I, in fact, I always say and I always have the mantra of always try and get to the no. Always make the person you're selling to say no. Absolutely, but that also depends on what you're selling. So if you're selling a product that really doesn't fit that need and you know that and you're not going to pivot or you're not growing in that direction because you, feature, you focus on a niche, that's okay. If you're, if you're calling about a content platform or if you're calling about a platform that you're developing to grow based on what that customer is looking for, absolutely, but that's the purpose of the call. It's education. How can we improve our tool to be better so that we can potentially work with you? So depends on the reason. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's okay to, to ask for a referral. It's okay to say that you can help them to, hey, thanks for taking two minutes to, to listen to what we have to offer and why we think we can help you. Clearly, we're not a fit. Is there anybody else that you feel could benefit from what we're doing? Social capital, yep. Yeah. So they were almost like, you know what, we <coughs> don't, we like your business, but if we're not your fit, we don't want to work with you, yeah. but we can refer other people to you that can help solve your problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that was also interesting of like partnering with other companies that could help service your clients. Yeah, I think building that network is important. But more importantly, I like the first part of that. You know, if we're not a good fit, we'll address that right away. And the best sales cycles I've been in are where you start with saying, Look, let's run through the evaluation. It'll be a 30-minute call. If at any point during this 30-minute call you feel we're not really a strong fit for you, we just let me know. You know, and that way you're not chasing them down all the time. You won't get off that phone and then email them twice or try and call them and have them not respond to you. You just want to get a no, like Al said. I'd rather get a no than absolutely nothing and have this deal hanging over my head, wondering why I didn't lose it or if I should keep following up the guy. Should I show up at his kid's soccer game? You know, you want to know that it's not a good fit as soon as possible. Yeah. And I think we're getting a little off, off track, but. The thing is, is oftentimes salespeople get into sales cycles where they are trying to solve all of the problems of the customer. It's fine to understand all of your customer's challenges and what their priorities are. One thing I always say to my reps as well is, if you get the full scope of what somebody's challenges are, identify the 10 or 20% where we can really help and hone in on that. And let them know, hey, we can't help you with everything. We can certainly help you with this. This is where I think the conversation should be. And that actually shows, again, respect for the people's time and an understanding of their business, which is always a key driver of any successful cycle. 
So we'll continue because I know we're getting ahead of ourselves. If we want to go back to this, we can absolutely do it. So guys, we're just going to quickly go over a bad email. Uh, for anyone who's ever sent out a cold or a prospect email, you know, do you always get a response? And the obvious answer is no. I think the open rate of emails is around 50% and the response rate is something like 20%. So it's very difficult to get a response from a cold email. We're going to quickly look at uh, what actually kind of looks like not a bad email, but actually has some blatant flaws. So I know this is probably pretty tough for everyone in the back to read, but um, if everyone kind of the middle and the front uh, can read it, uh, great. Can I zoom it? I don't know. Can you zoom in on that? Can you hit control plus maybe? Command plus? Wait. Yeah, exactly. You got it. Yeah, it's a very one-sided email. Yeah, it, exactly. It's the, the me monster I've heard before. So I'll, I'll break it down a little bit. I know we talked about kind of formal salutations being important. Uh, I disagree a little bit. I think saying something like, dear Kevin, it almost puts you on an uneven keel. In sales, you want to be viewed as almost a subject matter expert or a consultant rather than a salesperson. Using salutations like dear or mister, to me it makes me feel like I'm getting a spam email or a mass email that's not going to be personalized. So I like to scrap out dear or mister. I just put hi and I use a first name. That first line, thanks for taking the time to read this email. Anyone see a problem with that? You're wasting my time. It cost me five seconds to make that. Absolutely, yeah. So that's a great point. First of all, this email is too long. We always say two scrolls on a mobile device. Most emails are answered on an iPhone or a, on a, on a cell phone or a, um, a smartphone. Uh, keep it really short, concise, and simple. But that first line, Yes, it eats up time, but it's also, again, putting you on that uneven keel. You're lowering this power dynamic, and you're not being viewed as a salesperson rather than someone who can provide real value to the business as a consultant. So I always avoid saying, thank you for your time. Uh, I'll end an email or a call and say, was this helpful? I find that to be a lot more impactful than thanking them for their time. The introduction, my name is Chris Graham from this account, or I'm um, from this company. Uh, I always scrap the introductions. Uh, you know, your name is on the email right next to the body of the email. You don't really need to repeat your name. Again, it eats up that valuable space, space there. Second paragraph of an email should always be about the prospect, be about their company, be a unique tidbit you found about them online, something that's going to resonate with them and create a connection. Uh, again, I'm kind of just talking about myself here. Saying I a lot, uh, I'm saying I'd love the opportunity. You know, your prospects don't care what you'd love to do. They want value, and they're only going to talk to someone who they think can provide them immediate and compelling value. They don't care that you'd love the opportunity to do this, that, or, or whatever. Other than that, um, I think that's about it. Am I missing anything that anyone thinks is pretty glaring? Just the reason. Just the reason. Yep, good point. Castle, mm -hmm. it's illegal to, bl to blast off a list, but you can absolutely send individually targeted messages. Yeah, it'd be from a market automation tool yeah. like a HubSpot or a yeah, so or MailChimp. Yeah, so if somebody, if, you, if somebody opts out from receiving emails off your website, absolutely Castle laws apply. But if I go on and say I find somebody's email, I can email them personally. It's directly from my email to their email. It's not out of a tool like a marketing automation software, so it's all right, yeah. I think otherwise it'd be pretty difficult to, to prospect. I think otherwise it'd be pretty tough to prospect if you had to get the permission first, but I, I know exactly what you're saying, but yeah, I think it's more for mass emailing. There's three to four value propositions in here, which can be effective. Typically, I like to lead with one value proposition because it cuts down on the length of that email. And if I don't get a response, I'll send a different value proposition that I know my company can address uh, in a second email and a third email, but I'll keep it to one or two per email. And then the last line there, uh, there's no strong call to action. I'm saying, let me know your thoughts on this. No one reading the email is going to sit there and like, you know, I'm going to type in all my thoughts to this guy. You need a, a compelling call to action. And we'll go over that. But saying something like, do you have 15 minutes next Tuesday for a short call to discuss? That's a much more uh, compelling reason to call or to, to respond. Uh, it's a stronger call to action than let me know your thoughts, because no one is going to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that we talked about in the beginning was how many touches does it take to actually get a response from a prospect? If you give all of your value propositions in the first email, you kind of don't have a reason to email them again. So you need to hold things back, 
both to shorten the email, but also to give yourself an opportunity to continue prospecting to show different value propositions to your customer. And we didn't really touch on it here, but in that second follow-up, we've always been taught never save, just checking in, just following up on my last email. Like Al said, always provide a new value prop or a new reason for them to read that email. So avoid following up, avoid checking in. Question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't ever close my emails like that. Um, I've never read anything bad about it, but yeah, I, I could say that's sort of a, a you make an assumption that they are going to call you back. But yeah, I personally, I don't, I don't mind that so much when you've already built rapport. You know, that I look forward to speaking with you would usually be replaced by a call to action. So actually, asking for something or um, suggesting something, for example. So if this looks familiar to you, it's because it's very similar to the formula for a successful call. So warm emailing comprises of a compelling reason for the email. Why are you emailing them? And why are you emailing them right now? It's got to be key. Three, a clear call to action. And then, of course, is correct formatting. I cannot tell you how often we see emails that are misspelled or have bad grammar or um, aren't punctuated right. And as soon as somebody reads that, they're like, this guy didn't even take the time to proofread his email. Why would I bother responding if he doesn't even take the time to actually proofread? And then reference relatable clients. So a compelling reason for the email. Hey, Mr. Prospect, the reason for my email today is because I saw you just received new funding on your venture startup. Um, the reason I'm emailing you right now is because we're helping venture capitalists t today save, on average, 50% of their operating costs on all hiring resources. What I'd love to do is chat with you for 15 minutes, or do you have 15 minutes at 1 p.m. tomorrow to chat about how we're helping other companies exactly like yours reduce their operating costs? We've already helped X, Y, and Z company do that. I'll look forward to hearing if this is a good time or other good times that work for us to connect. Again, look forward there. It doesn't really give me a bad rap because it's actually related to my call to action. So just an example of how we could actually directly apply that. Before we show you uh, some samples of this in action from both Chris and I, the key to a, a strong email, if you have good content, you have a good uh, paragraph or the body of the, of the email is good, doesn't really matter unless you have a subject line that would actually prompt them to open the email. So Chris, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the Yesware statistic. Yeah, so has anyone here heard of uh, this, well, it's not really a startup anymore, the company Yesware? Great, a couple people have. This is something I strongly check, recommend checking out. So they've created, the original product was a, a red receipts email tracker. So when you send an email to a customer, it pings you when the customer opens that email. It lets you know, A, they've engaged with their content, B, they're probably at their computer, meaning they're probably at their phone, so you can give them a call and it's a good time to reach out. Now they've moved on from that and they've got it into a lot of data analytics on email metrics. I strongly recommend downloading an ebook they have. It talks about what words are effective in a subject line, what words get response rates in an email. It <coughs> even drills down what words in a subject line uh, against other similar words like intro versus introduction, which words actually get open rates and a response rate. Uh, I, like I said, definitely check it out. Even just Google yes where email tips if you're doing a lot of email prospecting. You find a lot of really valuable tips. Some quick ones for you guys, quick win tips. Using the prospect's name in a subject line for an email increases your open rates. Using the company name uses increases their open rates. Using things that are trending. So right now, video is something that is very, very high in terms of trending. So using video in a subject line actually increases subject lines. Uh, excuse me, increases opens. So staying on top of what people want to read about is important to actually drive open rates on emails because you can't get a response if your customers aren't actually opening your emails because the subject lines aren't appealing to them. Mm -hmm. And yes, we'll cover a lot of those different words. Like, for example, if you have a statistic or a number, which you always should, using the digits rather than writing the actual word increases your response rate by 11% or something like that because it stands out in inbox. Like Al said, the most important thing that I always do is putting the name at the front of the subject line. Now, we didn't talk too much about triggers, but we talked a lot about research. And the intent of doing all that research before you send that email is to find a trigger or a compelling reason to call. So this is just an example of something that um, worked very well for me. So rather than using you know, LinkedIn or, or Google Alerts, I was just on the company's blog. And I noticed that VP of Sales had written uh, article, an article about 
how good sales reps are like cats because they're coy, they're relaxed, um, they're confident, and poor sales reps are more like dogs. So they slobber when they get the hint of a good deal, and they chase tennis balls. You ask them for pricing, they're gonna get you pricing. You ask for a demo, they're gonna get you a demo. Uh, so it really just talked about the difference of the two. It was a good article, but the real value here is in the email. So the subject line, which I'll admit is, is stupid if you jump to the next one. It was just, David, you're hiring any cats. I mean, this is, it's a stupid subject line, but it's gonna stand out in the inbox. A, because it's got his name. B, it's about something he's written. So doing a little bit of research on your company, again, it shows that not only am I taking my time to really understand who he is, I'm only reaching out because I think my solution is gonna re resonate with him. And I probably worked with very similar companies as, as his in the past. Reference the quick uh, article in the beginning, again, showing that I've done my research, and then doing my value prop uh, in, the, in the second paragraph there. And again, a very strong call to action at the very bottom. Uh, it's a concise, shorter email. And really, the reason this prompted me to reach out to you is because. And that word because is a power word. Uh, it triggers the brain that the important part of the subject is, is coming. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the, the, the photocopier story. Um, where they measured the impactfulness of uh, the word because. People were butting in line to do copies at a, a copy shop, and if they said, hey, do you mind if I just jump in here? The response, yeah, the response is typically no. But if they said, do you mind if I jump in here because I'm in a rush? The response is typically yes. So using the word because triggers the brain that something important is coming, and it lets them know that you have a strong value prop and for a reason. To that point, that study went as so far to have people jump in and say, do you mind if I jump in here because I need to make copies? Or do you mind if I jump in here because I want to make my copy because before you make your copy? And the increased rate of yeses to noes was actually substantially higher because of the, because of the word because being interjected into the reason for cutting in line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, yesware, if you download the ebook, will cover a lot of this. It even talks about using the word and instead of the word but. Uh, there's a lot of just small words you could interchange in your emails, uh, even in your, in your speech, that I think would increase uh, open, res open rates or response rates are really just how your call to action is, is being accepted. Um, any questions about the emailing? We're going to jump into social selling next. So that kind of covers voicemails and emails and cold calling. Any questions about any of that? Yes. No, you want to start with something that's just will resonate with them. So I like to start with just uh, you know like a blog they, they've they've written um, anything that I can find online about them. If you just jump into here's what I think I can do, uh, I mean maybe if the value prop is compelling enough that it, it talks about what you've done for similar comp companies or customers, I think it's good. But again, I want to show that I've done the due diligence to do my research and really understand that this is going to be a fit for them. Uh, Al, can you go back to that email there? Sure. Yeah, I guess I talked about research twice in that, and then I gave my call to action towards the end. Um, yeah, I always do my value prop either in the middle or the end, never in the beginning. Do you need to sign the email? Like, how much is message? Yeah, I've got a signature down there. I don't really like, I don't say thanks then in my emails. I don't say, uh, I sometimes say regards. Yeah. But uh, if I'm in a sales cycle, I'll say, was this helpful? Or have I missed anything? Uh, you can get pretty creative with how you want to close your emails. Just putting thanks can be kind of boring, and again, it's whatever sales rep is going to do. Yep. Any other questions? We can absolutely go over some of this stuff in the Q&A after as well, if we want to get through the end of this, and then chat a little bit more on what's interesting to you guys. And if you want to hear some stories, we can absolutely talk about that as well. Cool. So let's talk about social selling. So this is something that I really love. I push social selling like nobody's business, because my whole thing is, you got to go where your customers are. And I think the one thing that we've talked about, cold calling, emailing, everybody's doing it and it certainly has its place and it's certainly something that I wouldn't suggest stopping to do. But if you think about it, the average prospect gets about 200 emails per day. Tim Cook of Apple, 700 emails a day. The CEO of Tommy John doesn't check his email between 9 and 5. The CEO of Birchbox, um, Katya Beauchamp, she doesn't respond to emails unless the subject line has a call to action directly in the subject line. So what does that say to you? 90% of executives actually don't respond to cold emails. Now that's where your formula and your touches start to go up when you're reaching out via phone, knocking on doors, cold emailing, cold calling to try and catch that individual at a time that makes sense. Or you could actually go where your buyers are. 
a lot of the people that we're reaching out to today, especially if you're searching for those enterprise companies, especially if you're reaching out to those C-levels and V-levels, are on Twitter, they are on LinkedIn, they are on Facebook, they are on Instagram. So why not go where they are? Why not reach out to them at the platforms that are publicly available to you and everybody else? A message to a CEO on, on Twitter, when's the last time somebody saw an article of Coca-Cola being tweeted and then not responding and the whole world blows up like Coca-Cola didn't respond to this customer, they don't care about customer service. It's crazy. It's the same thing with CEOs. That's their public persona. Going where they are is, is in incredibly important. Buyers who use social media typically actually have larger budgets. So typically 84% bigger than companies who don't use social media. So that's telling you, hey, we want to be reached out to. We have the budget to be able to purchase if it makes sense. Did you say tell us? Do you <coughs> tweet them publicly? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, tweet at, I tweet at CEOs. I tweet at companies. I, I'll write articles on LinkedIn and at mention the people who are my prospects in order to engage them in conversation to show value not only as a salesperson but also as a human being. So rather than sending them a private tweet, you send them a public one. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll show you I'll show you a screenshot in a second of what one of my reps does really effectively. Um, the last point on this before I show you that screenshot is becoming a subject matter expert. So 82% of the, your buyers will view eight five to eight pieces of content before engaging in a cycle. Social sellers are actually 75% or 79% likely to attain more of their quotes. I can't remember the exact percentage, but today your buyers are so far down the funnel before they actually engage in a sales cycle with you, and they're getting that information from places like LinkedIn, from Twitter, from your website. So if you go where your buyers are and you're able to communicate with them when and where they're looking for the information, <coughs> statistically you have a, a, a much higher chance of driving your sales cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of success in participating in conversations on LinkedIn. And if you can track where your recipients, your prospects are, what groups are they following, uh, you can just make a point to answer questions in that group and really just become a subject matter expert. So when you do choose to reach out to them, you know, maybe your name resonates with them a little bit. Maybe they are familiar with who you are or they, um, you can reference whatever question you may have answered. Uh, it's really just about content curation. Uh, build up your Twitter account, um, share really compelling articles or anything that resonates with your solution. And like I said, just become an expert in your domain, whether it's a startup or you're working for a startup or you're a founder. Um, just be that resource that they can go to if they need um, just advice or just you know, become that consultant and not that salesperson. And I don't have the screenshot here, but just to further my example, one of my reps does a really, really great job of uh, attacking buyers on Twitter in terms of actually providing the opportunity for us to engage with them. So she will. She tweeted at Freshy and just said, "Hey, couldn't get through to you guys via email or phone. Can somebody just email me back at this at this particular email?" Freshy tweeted her back within five minutes and said, "Hey, you can reach us at this email." A conversation ensued. She tweeted at Atlanta Breads, which is another food company. And Atlanta Breads didn't have a phone number. And she's like, "Hey, I, you guys don't have a phone number? I'm looking to chat with somebody about how we can help you grow your content." And Atlanta Breads said, "Hey." direct message us and we'll absolutely have a conversation with you. Tons of examples of that where you're actually going to those public personas. You guys have all seen the Wendy's Twitter. They're the most active. McDonald's, super active. You know, those are where your customers are and asking to talk to them about value propositions on their public personas is a great way to actually activate a sales cycle or, or just a conversation even and an educational cycle. I definitely rec recommend trying this if this is something that you haven't done. Start building up your social persona as an expert in the field of what you're selling. Mm -hmm. What have you guys tried? You know, what do you think we may have missed in terms of social selling? Yes. I say maybe SEO is is a little bit different, but yeah, if you're publishing that content, you're doing the keyword optimization, and you're driving traffic to your own website, yeah, absolutely. Um, but at the same, I think it, it depends. So if you're talking about content on your website, that's like blog content, and you're driving hits hits to a blog. That's really creating that subject matter expertise of where can people go to find information about this. If you're directly prospecting at somebody, then I wouldn't say that's really social selling. That's more like social education or education through a social setting that allows people to garner the information. And usually that content does have a call to action like reach out to us, 
And that would more qualify as a marketing qualified lead versus an outbound sales lead. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good question. I guess it's kind of like borderline social selling. But. Yeah, so if you're blogging on LinkedIn, that I think would be an example of social selling. If you're blogging on your website, that would be an example of um, driving inbound leads so that you actually generate marketing well, qualified. What, what makes it just a social I think selling? just because of the medium, uh, I'd say the messaging would have to be slightly different. I'd say content you publish on your website might be a little bit more formal, whereas LinkedIn, you might be you know, answering someone's question, you might be addressing or referencing a previous post. Um, not to say you can't repurpose the same content, but I've always been taught that you know, your messaging on Facebook has to be a little bit different than what you're putting on Twitter versus your blog versus LinkedIn. So for me, it's you're, in one case, you're reaching out to your customers. You're saying, hey, we have a solution that fits for you. Here's, what I'm, here's, here's why we should talk. Tweet at them. LinkedIn them, tag the person, so I would be like, hey Chris, I could really help you dress better, message me. Um, that's different, here's a blog post on how to wear a blazer. Yes, exactly, so you're actually going after that person versus a marketing qualified lead, which is putting something out there that's like, hey, would you like to learn how to do this? Call us, we'll help you do that. Would you like to learn more about this? Email us, we'll absolutely have that conversation with you. So, marketing versus sales. Yeah, you're talking about advocacy marketing. So that's leveraging your existing network to essentially create a referral to that next client who's already a warm introduction. Yeah, that's a great strategy. That's like the age old classic word of mouth, right? You're gonna buy something, if I know you and I say, hey, Chris sells the best dress shirts in all of Toronto, you're like, cool, yeah, I'll go check Chris out because my opinion is trusted. So that's advocacy marketing. And if you can do that, that's not really cold calling or prospecting, that's actually generating warm leads to get somebody further down the funnel than you know, just reaching out cold. And you can do that in, in B2B selling as well. So I mean, the shirt example, that's B2C, you can set up maybe an affiliate campaign or something like that. But in B2B selling, you have a lot of power in the negotiation phase. And I know I'm getting off topic because it's not really prospecting. But let's say you do have someone engaged in a sales cycle and you're towards the end of it and they say, you know what, it's kind of out of the realm of our budget. We need a little bit of a break here. We always advocate no unilateral discounts. You never say, you know what, I'll give you a discount on that. You know, we can get this done. You always want something in return. You want to act like this discount is the biggest thing going on right now. You so, say, you know what, maybe I can get you that discount in return. I would need maybe three or four introductions to customers just like, who, just like you, who you think might see value in a solution like mine. So you can do it both B2C and B2B with just different techniques. Absolutely. But I, I, if you could do that, do that every single time and ignore this. Always get people to sell for you if you can. Your customers. Yeah, sure, so let's say you have a successful customer. Let's say Ryerson University is using your IT platform for registering students for startup school presentations. They love it. You know your customers love it. You've asked for feedback. Ryerson's like, yep, great. It's okay for you to say to Ryerson, hey, since you love our platform so much, do you mind making an introduction to University of Toronto? I actually saw on LinkedIn that you were connected to the head of IT there. I think that they have a similar challenge that you faced and would love if you could potentially make a warm introduction there. That actually gets your customers to advocate for you. That's obviously through secondary connections and you having done the research to say, yes, this person can map that out for me. But that customer actually has to have a potential new customer for you before they can make that referral. 
The other way to do that is case studies, sorry, case studies, success stories, pushing that on your website, webinars, having your customers speak for you. Uh, if you're attending a conference to push your product or educate the market on your product, having consumer panels come, discuss how they're leveraging it, what the savings are associated with it. So you really want to put your customers where your prospects are to allow them to talk about why your technology is successful for them. Any other questions? All right. Sweet. So just before we finish up here, the one thing that I, I always like to finish all of these presentations with is you know, there's no magic formula to sales success. If you look at a Zuckerberg or you look at the CEO of Echobee, it just seems like it came overnight, but none of that happened without hard work. You really do have to put the time in and apply the formulas, make the calls, put in the emails, do your four to eight touches to start seeing success. And once you start seeing success, it starts to roll, but none of that happens without hard work. So we do definitely talk about formulas and methodologies and tips and tricks, and those can absolutely help cut corners or accelerate your path, but I always like to focus on hard work. And the reason I use this slide is everybody, if anybody's a basketball fan, Kyrie Irving broke his knee. Everybody thought he was done, young man. Last year came back and hit the championship winning shot in game seven. And that's a real testament to, you know, it looks easy. Everybody sees the flash. Everybody sees the glory. Nobody sees what goes on behind the scenes to actually put in that work to get the results to make you successful. And I really can't emphasize this enough because I don't think any successful salesperson especially is going to be anywhere without the drive and dedication to apply some of those stats that we put back today. Guys, typically here we would ask the audience to write a couple um, sample prospecting emails. I know we're kind of coming up on the time here, so what would be more valuable? Just kind of a, a Q and A, or do we want to try writing some sample emails and put them up on the screen and, and critique them? Sample emails. Okay. <laughs> 